Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Tustin, California. I'm Kay Sylvester, the rector, and I welcome you in the name of Christ. Today represents a turn in the season of the year. We've just completed Christmas, and we've now had the Feast of the Epiphany, and this is the season uh, referred to prosaically as the season after the Epiphany. It's considered ordinary time, but it holds some extraordinary moments, including today's feast, which is a celebration of the baptism of Jesus by John in the Jordan River. We remember today our own baptismal vows that call us to seek and serve Christ in all people. Let's worship. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. God of the tearing heaven, whose holiness is unveiled by one who is submerged in all the pain and sin of earth, give us faith to follow him who goes to the heart of darkness bearing only the spirit of gentle, insistent peace. Through Jesus Christ, the promised one. Amen. A poem by Rumi. The breeze of dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. A poem by Jan Richardson. Blessing the Threshold. This blessing has been waiting for you for a long time while you have been making your way here. This blessing has been gathering itself, making ready, 
biding its time, praying. This blessing has been polishing the door, oiling the hinges, sweeping the steps, lighting candles in the windows. This blessing has been setting the table as it hums a tune from an old song it knows. Something about a spiraling road and bread and grace. All this time it has kept an eye on the horizon, watching, keeping vigil, hardly aware of how it was leaning itself in your direction. And now that you are here, this blessing can hardly believe its good fortune that you have finally arrived, that it can drop everything at last to fling its arms wide to you, crying, welcome, welcome, welcome. The good news of Jesus according to Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt, a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Savior. In the name of God, whose kingdom is the kingdom of love. Amen. This is one of those weeks when preachers everywhere ripped up everything they had written at the beginning of the week. The events in our capital and around the country on January 6th have riveted our attention and challenged us as followers of Jesus to ask ourselves a lot of hard questions. And in the context of this challenging time, this rather frightening time, we're given the story today of the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River by his cousin John. At first glimpse, this story doesn't seem to have much to do with our present political reality, or in terms of COVID, or the many stressors that are bearing in on us at this moment. People I know are frightened. They're tired of being isolated. They're angry at people who are flouting COVID restrictions. And regardless of political affiliation, most of the people I have talked to are shocked and saddened and terrified by the storming of Congress by a mob egged on by rhetoric from the top office in the land. So what does this have to do with the baptism of Jesus? What does the baptism of Jesus have to do with our current moment? The events of January 6th and the story in our gospel seem to be separated by culture, time, distance, every possible metric. But I see this story in a more layered way than perhaps I ever have. The events of the last year, the shutdowns, our conflicts, our protests, the unprecedented ways in which our public life is being lived out on our television screens and on social media can be informed by this story. This story seems simple on the surface. John is baptizing by the Jordan, inviting people to repent and to use their baptism as a sign of their willingness to repent, their willingness to change, their willingness to be transformed and to work toward lifelong transformation. And into that river of change and resolve steps Jesus of Nazareth, who has traveled from Nazareth of Galilee to the Jordan River in Judea 
to seek the baptism of John the Baptist. I've often wondered what Jesus thought about as he stepped into that river. I remember when I was a new Christian asking the question, why did Jesus have to be baptized anyway? Did he have things to repent from? Well, we don't know the answer to that, but what we do know is what happened next. I imagine Jesus being held under the waters of the Jordan by those strong brown hands. And in that moment of ritual drowning, I imagine him seeing his life with a new perspective. Everything up to that moment in his life has led him to this moment, this moment of transformation and commitment. This moment of choosing his adult ministry, choosing the life he's going to live from now on. When he comes up out of that water, the voice of love speaks to him and calls him beloved. Then the very next thing that happens is that the Spirit of God hurls him into the wilderness to listen and to prepare. One of the oddities of this time we're in is that we've not had ready access to the sacraments of the church. We haven't conducted a baptism for at least a year. We haven't had funerals or weddings. We had a brief shining period where we were having Eucharist together on the lawn, but mostly we've not had access to that sacrament either. And yet the church survives. And this suggests to me that sacrament is something besides magic. The fact that we've not baptized anyone in the last year does not mean that baptism has suddenly been invalidated. The fact we've not been able to have Eucharist together does not mean that the Eucharist is somehow optional or not of value. But what it does mean is that we've had to rediscover and relearn our baptism. We've had to rediscover and relearn our place at the Eucharistic table, absent those reliable physical signs. And what I think we are learning and what I think Jesus understood and began to embody immediately upon his baptism is that we are the sacraments. We're empowered by the physical sacraments of water and bread and wine blessed and shared to become sacraments of God's love in the world. Those of you who've sat through my confirmation class have heard this definition more than once. A sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It's not magic. It's not mechanical. It's a sign. It points to something. And as I said the last time I preached this occasion, there is a tiny engine operating in these sacraments. And that engine is the engine of continual transformation of our hearts and souls and our willingness to place our bodies in the service of love. When Jesus was baptized, there were no formal vows that he took. There was probably not much going on in the way of ceremony. But we do have this story in all four Gospels. And we are told that God was visibly and audibly present at Jesus' baptism. And from that moment forward, Jesus became the minister of love he was designed to be. His first act was to go into the desert to listen for the voice of God, and his second act was to begin his work of healing and teaching and feeding, to make visible the love of God in these very tangible ways. And so it is with us. When we remember our baptism, when we reaffirm in our souls those vows, we are choosing sacramental life. We are choosing life lived as a sign of God's love. You may think that's only for the heroic types, for the Mother Teresas and Oscar Romeros and Dorothy Days of the world, who literally gave up everything. But I submit that almost none of us would be here in worship, in church, in Christian life, without millions of people who did their best, day by day, to live as sacraments of God's love and grace. Most of us can't keep it up 24-7, but we can all choose daily moments of awareness of the sacramental nature of our lives. 
we can choose to recall the fact that we are God's beloved and that as God's beloved, we are signs to the world around us of God's love. And the gift that the church gives us is kind of an outline of what that should look like in the vows we repeat at baptism. When the 1979 Book of Common Prayer was being assembled over several years, the team that worked on the baptismal rite decided they needed something to connect baptism more explicitly to lived experience. They wanted to emphasize that baptism was not just sprinkling water on a baby. They consciously placed the baptismal rite in the center of the new prayer book to recover its place in our tradition as initiation into Christian life. And to that end, they created the set of vows we now use. And those vows outline for us what it means to live that sacramental life, what empowers us to be signs of God's love as surely as Jesus was. Most of us will not spend a life on foot healing people wherever we go, it doesn't mean we can't be healers. Most of us will never attempt to feed 5,000 people with a tiny bit of bread and a few fish, but we can all feed hearts and bodies and minds. Almost none of us can walk on water. Almost none of us can do the miraculous things that Jesus did except this one thing. We can commit to a baptismal life to a Eucharistic life, a life in which sacrament feeds us and signals to us God's desire for us. Like Jesus, we can serve as bearers of God's grace. Let's talk for just a moment about those baptismal vows. Here is where the rubber meets the road in terms of recent events in this country. In very churchy, traditional language, we promise to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. We promise to repent when we fall into sin. We promise to share good news. We promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves. And we promise to respect the dignity of every human being and to strive for justice and peace. There is a profound and unshakable connection between our baptismal vows and our baptismal lives. We are called to a life of loving our neighbor. We are called to a life of striving for justice and peace. And while that life begins formally with our baptismal vows, we cross that threshold, we make that commitment over and over and over again in every decision we make, individually and corporately. We decide every day whether we will live a baptismal life. We decide every day whether we will be a sign of life and light and love. We decide whether we will actively seek and serve Christ in all persons, whether we will love our neighbors, whether we will respect the dignity of every human being, whether we will strive for justice and peace or not. In a world made dim by violence and hatred and separation. On January 6th, we watched a mob engage in the violent occupation of our capital. Among the thousands were people carrying Bibles and crosses, along with signs affirming their allegiance to Jesus. Among many nauseating and repellent words and actions from that day, I found this most disturbing that anyone found a way to connect those actions on Capitol Hill with the life and work of Jesus of Nazareth. This action was not godly. It was not Christian. It was not patriotic. The co-opting of Jesus and symbols associated with him in this horrific assault on our nation calls us to make our voices heard. As people who are trying day by day to follow the Prince of Peace. People need to hear a genuine word of hope. 
People need to see people whose hallmark are kindness to neighbors and justice for all. What will you choose today? Will you choose to walk along the edge of the Jordan and say, oh, this baptism business is fine for other people, I'm just fine, thank you? Or will you bravely step into the chilly waters of transformation and death and rebirth? Will you step into the waters that will cleanse you of fear and empower you to be a sign of God's love for those around you? I can't help but long for the days when baptisms happen fairly regularly and Eucharist happened every week. And yet, this time in the wilderness has heightened their value for me while reframing them. I see them now as our best efforts to embody in ritual the entire life of following Jesus. We enter the waters of baptism in order to choose a life of growing toward those vows we repeat. We meet at Christ's table to receive food for body and soul that will sustain us in our efforts. The sacraments of the church prepare and nourish us, but ultimately we have the choice. We can go through the motions or we can step into the chilly river and hear God calling us beloved. What comes next is the wilderness, which we enter over and over in different seasons of our lives as we deepen our relationship to the holy and learn to take responsibility for living our lives as signs of God's grace. Like Jesus, we're invited to shape the character of our living by choosing to step into moments and situations of growth and transformation. While we are separated from the rite of baptism, while we fast from communion, we nonetheless carry that grace in our pockets. Though we are not sharing bread and wine, we still share the nourishment of this community. Though we haven't repeated our baptismal vows together for a long time, we still share the commitment of those vows and we engage in the ongoing work of transforming ourselves and transforming the world around us into the kingdom that God intends. Our baptismal vows begin with a personal and communal commitment to worship and prayer, to checking our spiritual GPS regularly, and to share good news. But those final two vows make it clear that the purpose of a baptismal life is not for the individual, or for the church, but for the world. We promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons. We promise to respect the dignity of every human being and strive for justice and peace. These vows invite us to embody our citizenship in the kingdom of God. We, the baptized, hold dual citizenship. We are called to be good citizens of this world, of this country, to take responsibility for our actions as citizens here. And at the same time, we are busy building the deeper reality that Jesus called the kingdom of God. And our higher loyalty is to God's dream for us. This informs our citizenship in whatever nation we live in. We vow, as followers of Jesus, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, no matter what our government says. We promise to respect the dignity of every human being, no matter what our government does. We promise today and every day to strive for justice and peace so that this world and this country and this state and this town and this parish will more closely resemble the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed. We choose today the challenge of sacramental living. We choose a world in which we love and serve our neighbors. We choose to be good citizens of this country by embodying our citizenship in the realm of God, where mercy, love, and justice prevail. 
Amen. Let's say together our affirmation of faith. This is what we know to be true. Out of the chaos of the waters, God spoke light and life into the world, creating all things to contain God's glory and display God's love. This is what we know to be true. In the midst of the chaos and beauty of human life, Jesus was born. He lived a life completely full of God. He fed and healed, taught and turned the world upside down. He spoke the truth of love to power and died with that truth intact. The risen Christ lives among us and within us that we might do even greater things. This is what we know to be true. The Holy Spirit, like breath, like wind, is the power of God moving over and through us. By the power of the Spirit, we proclaim God's kingdom and serve God's world. This is what we know. We are God's because God loves us. Amen. O oh God, your light streams into the world and brings us hope. Help us to welcome your light and to be brave in following where it leads us. In the face of rising infections and incomprehensible deaths, help us to continue to choose safety. Remind us that we belong to one another and we are responsible to and for one another. We pray, God of love, for those who are ill. Stay beside them. Help them to connect to your spirit for strength and hope. We pray, God of love, for those who have died. Receive them into your light and peace and comfort and sustain those who mourn. We pray, God of love, for our leaders Help them to choose selfless service, wise counselors, care with the resources at their disposal, and a vision of our highest ideals. We pray, God of love, for our schools, for administrators, for teachers, for students, and for parents. We pray, God of love, for our neighbors. Help us to see the divine spark in each one and to serve them in your name. We pray, God of love, for our church. Bind us to one another by your love. Grant us wisdom and perseverance in the face of continued separation, and bless our efforts to proclaim good news in new ways. God of love, we praise you for your many gifts to us, the gift of life, the gift of relationships, that bear up under the strain of separation, the gift of our extraordinary planet, and for the gift of a bright new year in which we pray for the strength to make a difference by your grace. We pray because of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. In you, O God, there is no darkness at all. We bring into the light of your love our poor choices. Forgive us, Holy One, for our failures in loving our neighbors, for our passivity in the face of suffering, for our neglect of your beautiful world. By your grace, may we choose the challenge of transformation. Grant us the strength and wisdom to follow your path of love. Amen. God's grace surround us and uphold us. We are beloved and forgiven. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Receive our gifts, O God, bless and break them, that all may be fed in your holy name. Amen. May the light of Christ lead you. May the peace of the Spirit uphold you. May the love of God empower you to love. And the blessing of God, who creates, sustains, and liberates us, rest upon you today and evermore. Amen. Let us go forth shining with the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.